Tonight's message um, came about, um, I was watching, anybody ever watch something and they didn't agree with? Um, that's what this, this whole message came about. There was this guy that uh, I was watching on TikTok, and um, well, that's why that, that was, I was watching him, and uh, he was showing over scripture and different things, and he came about to this, and this is where the, the, this came about. So you'll know this by the title, Can You Lose Your Salvation? Uh, that is the title of the message. We're going to go over all the options that he said. We're going to look at scripture, the history, the everything about that, and then we're going to go through the ending on what the scripture says in my point of view on it. So many people in the world believe salvation has no guarantees. Uh, before we start into this, because this is kind of a lot to, to hit at once, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach tonight. I thank you, Lord, for the people that's come out to hear it. I just pray, Lord, that you would help me to be able to present it in such a way uh, that it is not only biblical, but it's uh, that you would have it to be taught. I just pray, Lord, that you would give me calmness in speech, and I just pray, Lord, that if anybody is questioning uh, as far as where they lie with you, as far as the security of salvation, I just pray, Lord, that tonight uh, that they would have it settled once and for all, and I, and I pray that you would use this message according to your glory and and I pray, Lord, that you would uh, have your way in it. And all this we ask and thank in your name. Amen. All right, so the denominations that believe that you can lose your salvation. Uh, this is what I found. It was the Methodists, the Catholics, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the United Church of God, Lutherans, above all things. I did not know Lutherans did that because they, because I was a Lutheran, <laughs> and I wasn't taught that growing into the church, but... They believe that you could fall away. Um, shocking to me. Pentecostals and Church of Christ. Those are the main ones. The exceptions, of course, is people, it says, that lean towards grace, uh, which they lean Baptist. Like they said that this is a Baptist belief. That's what they say. And then ultimately the people that are Calvinist, people that believe that you're elected and you're predestined to go there. So if you're predestined to go there, you absolutely can't lose your salvation. <coughs> so, uh, I want to be transparent. Uh, I started coming to this church. I have this, all this written out. In 2010, Pastor Spencer went over a book with me. It was The Basics of Christian Belief. He kind of explained what a Baptist was. When I came here, I had no idea what a Baptist was. Uh, I just knew everything what a Lutheran was. So they kind of showed me the... So I read through the Bible while reading people commentary. I was going through and he said Charles Stanley is good. Adrian Rogers is good. So I would read their books and he says, you know, study the Bible. He had a Charles Reary Bible. So he said, you know, that's a good Bible to have. So I took what I learned and applied the truth that I had uh, and I compared it to the teachings of this church. It's one thing to say that you're a Bible believing church, but it's another thing to teach uh, the doctrines and what it is. So when I learned that the Bible and the teachings uh, lined up, I stayed here. Um, pretty simple. And I'm pretty sure Frank Painter, you know, if he spoke anything outside, he would have left, or anybody that went there would have left. So the reasons people stay in false churches, just in general, we're going to go through family. That's the biggest. Uh, don't want to upset uh, peace in the home. Uh, now we're going to go real quick to Matthew chapter 10, 32 through 37. So Matthew 10, 32 through 37. So this is about the family. And then we're going to get into the verses. So Matthew 10, 32 through 37, it says... Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think that I am come to send peace on earth. I have come not to send peace, but a sword. 
For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against their mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And in verse C, For a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother, father or mother, more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So when you have family discrepancies over faith, God is just saying this, or Jesus, and since you can see that it's in red, it doesn't come to a shock to him that there's discrepancies in the home when it comes to faith. Uh, it is something that he established. Now, ultimately, it starts off and says... Um, as far as confessing and denying. Many people will not share their view because they don't want to struggle or cause harm, but you should. Knowledge of Scripture is number two. So first one is family, second is knowledge of Scripture. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. I'm going to hit the struggles, and then I'm going to go over the verses of what they have. So 2 Timothy and verse 15 it says study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth now, I've used this before in, a, in previous sermons but it says to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed um, a preacher can say anything up here um, you can listen and hear anything, but it's up to you to find out for certain if it is true. So study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, and then the third is what we don't like to hear, but you're not saved. Uh, the reason why you can't detect false doctrine is yet that you yourself are not saved. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Verses 12 through 14. 1 Corinthians 2. And then we have 12 through 14. And it starts off with number 12. It says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. We might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the first two verses of this, 12 and 13, speaks of a saved person. The Holy Spirit gives the understanding. Now verse 14, But the natural man, that's the lost person, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If you rely on your family, Sometimes they can bring you astray, not maybe your immediate family, but somebody in your family. Knowledge of Scripture, if you don't study. And then lastly, if you're not saved, those things can lead you into a false sense of understanding. So number one, people that believe that you can lose your salvation, the first verse that they said was Hebrews 3.12. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. This is the first verse. So if you hear stuff like this, you can kind of understand uh, so you don't have to um, believe, I guess, what they have to say. Um, so I hope that I do it justice. I hope that you can understand where I'm coming from when you see my comparison. So verse 12 um, of Hebrews 3 it says take heed brethren lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God so they said that you can depart from the living God that they says that you can believe and then that you can depart and then it gives it warning now what is the reference let's go to verses 8 and 9 it's good to understand what the verses is before how it gets to verse 12 Verse 8, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the days of temptation in the wilderness. So is verse 12 talking about salvation? If it's talking about the wilderness? No. So verse 9, When your fathers tempted me, 
provoked me and saw my works of 40 years. So, just in case we think, okay, well maybe that's still talking about salvation. Let's go to Psalm 95. Let's go to Psalm 95. And then we're going to go to verses 8 through 10. So Psalm 95. Go there real quick. And we're going to go 8 through 10. Now you'll see kind of the same aspects in Hebrews chapter 8 that we just read. So let me read that to you. So 8 through 10. Harden not your hearts in the provocation as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me and provoked me and saw my work. And then we'll go all the way to number 10. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and I said it is people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways. This passage that they say that is tied to faith and that you can lose it from Hebrews 3.12 this is for Israel's lost faith in God and the wilderness. Salvation has nothing to do whatsoever with this verse. What does it say if, you, if a person does fall away? What should we do? Hebrews 6.6 6. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 6 Hebrews 6, verse 6. It says, if they shall fall away. I don't know if people have got there, but what does it say to do next? Renew. To renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves and the Son of God afresh and put them into an open shame. So when someone goes astray, what are we supposed to do? Renew them. We're supposed to bring them back into the fold when somebody goes astray. We're not supposed to say, well, you went astray that means that you went against God and you're doomed. So the second one is Hebrews 10.26. Hebrews 10.26. This is the next thing that they said. So Hebrews 10.26. This one I saw several times. Um, so we'll go over that real quick. In Hebrews 10.26 it says, For if we sin willfully... After that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifices for sin. Now I learned that that's where apostasy comes from. Apostasy is an intentional falling away or defection. Um, now we're going to go over this briefly um, because this verse says, after that we have received the knowledge. So this is based, so the next part is just based on what verse 26 says. So let's go to Matthew, put your, I don't know if you got a thing you can put here, but we're going to come back. Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 23. So Matthew chapter 13, and then we're going to go 18 through 23. Matthew 13, 18 through 23. This is the parable of the sower. So verse 18, it says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of uh, the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. This is the only time in all of this that Satan is at work. Satan, when it is not grown, he comes in and takes it away. Verse 20, But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he which heareth the word, and an and unknown uh, with joy receiveth. So he's joyful in receiving it. Yet hath no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when his tribulation and persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. So this is speaking of tribulation and persecution, he becomes offended. So he's fine as long as there is no tribulation or persecution. So, But he does the act himself. There's no work of Satan. So he also that receiveth seed among thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and the 
and he becometh unfruitful. So this one is the deceitful of riches. So this is another act that he does upon himself. Uh, and then, of course, verse 23, it says, But he that receiveth seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundred, some sixty, or some, yeah, some sixty and some thirty. So, that is when he comes, when the word is presented to him. So we have Satan then he becomes offended, and the other one is for riches. So that is when a person receives it. All the stuff that comes in that a person is afflicted and just receiving the word. So after receiving the word, what do you have to deal with? Romans 7, 18, and 19. So Romans 7, verses 18 and 19. So this is after the good ground is presented and after you've been saved, this is what happens. So Romans 7, 18 and 19. It says, For I know that is in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, uh, not, but the evil which I do, not that I do. So it's a struggle. For the person to live out the Christian faith because of the flesh. What leads us to sin? James 1, 14 and 15. So let's go to James 1. And then we're going to go to 14 and 15. So James 1, 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin is finished, bringeth forth death. Now what is the battle that goes in during the midst of all of this? Galatians 5, 16, and 17. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. So in the midst of all of this, so you have after receiving the word, you have contact with the flesh, you have desire which leads you to sin, and then you have Galatians 5, 16, and 17. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and those are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now let's go back to the text briefly. And that's Hebrews 10.26. So we're just going to go back there. Hebrews 10 verse 26. So it says, If we sin willfully after that which we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifices for sin. So when you have, can sin willfully, there's no battle. There's no confrontation. There's nothing inside of you that battles. There's no spirit that fights you. You can just willfully sin after receiving the knowledge. To reference, I guess, what I'm saying here, let's go here, then I'll explain my point here. So Numbers 15, 30 and 31. This, I think, says it better than what I could. So Numbers chapter 15, 30 and 31. Numbers chapter 15, 30 and 31. In verse 30, it says, But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproach uh, reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among the people. And this verse 31 is the main point here. 
because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. So if he can sin willfully after receiving knowledge, he is willfully despising it. It's like if I say to you, don't do this, like a kid, so I say, don't do this, and you willfully go against it. He is saying, if a person rejects the truth of Christ's death for sin, there is no other sacrifice for sin available. So if he says, this is the way to heaven, this is the way, and he goes on that there is no other way to come to God, only judgment remains. So he's saying that if you willfully sin after the knowledge, there's nothing. So if you come to somebody and you share the gospel with them and they willfully just remain the same person, it means that they've rejected what they have been told. So that's 1026. The third one is 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. We wouldn't mind going there. 2 Peter chapter 2, 20 and 21. I don't know if you can tell, but... <laughs> I listened to this guy and it kind of bothered me a little bit. So I don't know if I helped him out or not. And I probably helped his views, but I probably listened to it a couple of times. So 2 Peter chapter 2, 20 and 21. So 2 Peter chapter 2, 20 and 21. So it says, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it and turned from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now, in this part in verse 20 it says the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ now when you know something you can say that you have belief in it so this I want to see if this makes any sense so James 2 19 James chapter 2 and verse 19 let's see if James 2 19 Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Just because you have a knowledge or an understanding of something doesn't mean that you respect it. Doesn't mean that you take in because the devils themselves believe and tremble. So knowing the way and turning away, it is rejection. So let's go to Acts 26, 27, and 28. Acts 26, 27, and 28. 27 and 28. So this is King Agrippa, verse 27. Believest thou the prophets? And it says, I know that thou believest. So that's a bold statement. That says that I know that you can comprehend what I'm saying. Then Agrippa, and this is probably, this is really sad. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. How many people have ever witnessed to somebody and they're like so close, but then they turn away? That is the most aggravating thing ever. Like you leave and you feel like you're an utter failure, but you got them there, but you couldn't... <laughs> You couldn't get them over the hump. So there are many people, when you witness, uh, that they will agree with you on every aspect of the gospel. If you ask them, do you believe in God? Yep. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Yep. Do you believe he was born of a virgin? Yes. They will answer yes to everything. Mental knowledge is good. To know something is good. Let's go to Romans 10, 9, and 10. People generally know this, but I'll just go here anyway. Romans 10, 9, and 10. 
Romans 10, or 9 and 10. And if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, this part I think people can do. They can say, Lord Jesus. But to get to the second part here is key. And shalt believe where? In thine heart. heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So some people can go as far as their mouth. And that's it. They don't really get it into their heart. And I think this is, I'm, I'm copying this, I can't believe, I don't know who the pastor, I think every pastor that ever breathed has said this, but you can be lost 18 inches. I think I'm not, that's not my quote, it's been used before, but it's been so many people's I can't really quote the exact words. So 18 inches you can lose. So to have a mental knowledge and the heart knowledge is completely different. So salvation is a heart matter and not just a head knowledge. So the fourth one is Matthew 24, 13. I think I only have six. I think we got two more. Matthew 24, 13. This thing right here is a beauty. Matthew 24, verse 13. <laughs> Reading it kind of makes me laugh. Uh, but he that endureth unto the land and endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. How many people has ever heard that argument when they said that you endure to the end, you're going to be saved? Now, we're living in a similar world. Before we go there, let's hit to verses 10 through 12. Just, let's just back that up just for a little bit. 24, 10 through 12. And they shall many offend, uh, may be offended, and shall betray one to another, and shall hate one another, Verse 11 is the key here. And many false prophets shall rise up and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So that is the... You have to read that before you get to the verse 13. Now let's hit 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. It says, For the time will come when they will endure, when they will not, sorry, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap up for themselves teachers, teachings, sorry, teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the tooth, from the truth, can't tell, and shall be turned unto fables. How many churches have turned into that? Uh, they just want you to be happy. Uh, I saw something today, and if I upset people, I don't really want to, but it's just how I feel. A worship and praise service is more important than a message of the gospel, and they just do that instead of having service. If I wanted to go to a concert, I'd go to a concert. If I wanted to go to church to hear the Word of God, I'd go to church to hear the Word of God. I think that it is awful to replace God's Word with music. My opinion. So I hope that this church never does that. So that's getting off my little thing. So speaking of truly born again people, let's go back to the text. Matthew 24 Verse 13, it says, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The ones that can hold fast to the Word of God and not be deceived by false teachers. Which it says in this verse 11, just two more up. So false prophets. So the person that can understand sound doctrine and keep it. The people that can understand and they have the Holy Spirit in them that can discern right and wrong those people will endure and be saved. So, 2 John 10 and 11. So, 2 John 10 and 11. 
2 John chapter 10 and 11. It says, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of the evil deeds. And then we're going to go to Galatians 1 8. Galatians 1 8. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8. But though we or any angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed or condemned. So it tells us the importance of not allowing false teachings to come into you because it says that you're not supposed to bid them Godspeed and you are to let them be accursed. So, number five, we're almost done. So number five is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. This is one that they use. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein stand, but which also ye are saved, if you, this is where they do, if you keep in memory which I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Vain is simply empty, worthless, having no substance at all. We're going to go briefly to Romans 1, 21 and 22. Romans 1, 21 and 22. And the reason why I use so much scripture is I want to make sure that it's not just my words that are combating this. So, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools so when he understood that they had vain when they were you say when they believed in vain what did he do to combat their vain thinking? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and we'll go to the next two verses. What did he do? For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and then rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. What is he doing here? He's saying that you have this vain knowledge of Scripture. I'm going to correct it and give you what the Bible actually says. So that's what he does. So if someone is believing false doctrine, we should correct them uh, if they have vain belief. But if they bring to you false teachings, and you can kind of cast them aside. This is the last one. Uh, and then we'll go on to some verses on why you can not lose your salvation. So Acts 8. Let's go to Acts 8 briefly. Acts chapter 8. And then we're going to go to verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving uh, cut that himself was some... Great one. Um, and then we're going to go to verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So then this is one of the parts. Then Simon himself, Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and sign which were done. And then we're going to go down to verse 17. Then laid they, their, see, laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. 
And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, and whosoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 20 it says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Now, the guy said that he said that this man was saved, that it was a man that was believed and was baptized and he was saved. But let's just continue to the next just few verses. Thou hast not neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore in this thy wickedness and pray to God if perhaps the thoughts of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in gall of bitterness and in bonds of iniquity. So he is saying, okay, you were believed and was baptized, but maybe your heart's not in the right place. Can a person believe in God and still be a false apostle? Let's go to Matthew 7.15. Matthew 7, 15. If they can believe in God and still... There's 7, 15. And it even says it here in verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. And then 2 Peter 2, 1. In 2 Peter 2, 1. I didn't think I had this many verses in here. So 2 Peter 2.1 um, But there were false prophets also among the people as there will be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that, that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So there are people that will use the Bible and use the church and use influence for personal Gain. Uh, that person, if you were mine, was he dealt, he was sorcery. And he saw them laying on of hands and he wanted to make money. So he wanted to get access to power to make money. It wasn't as if he truly believed, and that's what he was saying. He's saying that, well, your heart is not right. If you truly believed and you truly, you wouldn't be thinking about money. Your heart really wouldn't be this way. But there are preachers uh, flying personal jets. There's preachers living in mansions. And this is a warning, I guess. Um, let's go to Matthew 18.6. Matthew 18.6. And then we're going to get to another message as well. Matthew 18.6. Matthew 18, 6. In Matthew 18, 6, and it says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a milestone were hung about his neck and that they were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, there's people that work with children, and I'm not saying that's anybody here that would lead a child into any form of bad behavior, but there is churches like the Mormon churches and different churches around here that train children in the wrong understanding and the wrong stuff and it says that they shouldn't be pat on the back what does that verse say they should be what drowned killed yeah they should just you know gone so then for the pastor you know leaving them not not, not leave them out Hebrews 13 17 Hebrews 13 17 Hebrews 13, 17. And it says, in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls. And this right here is the key thing. And they must give an account that they may do with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So they have to give an account 
to what they do. It doesn't say that they want death over them, but they have to give an account for everything that they say and do. So let's hit point two of eternal security. That's all the things that we got from as far as losing your salvation. Uh, so let's go to 1 John 5.13. 1 John 5.13. That's only a couple here. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So it says that you have eternal life and that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, it's not of, I guess it's a present uh, tense of the word. Messy, correct me if I'm wrong. Have is a present. It means that you have. That's a present tense. So having is that you have it right now. So you have eternal life. So let's go to John 3, 15, and 16. So John chapter 3, 15, and 16. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, there's another one, have eternal life. For God so loved the, see, does it have, yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, excuse me, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting. So that says it twice in a row. John 5, 24. I try to keep much in John. So 5, 24. Uh, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on me, that sent me, hath, that's everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So that hath is the same aspect. Uh, John 10, 28 through 30. John 10, 28 through 30. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall not perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my father's, or out of my hand. My father which gave them is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And it says that I and my father are one. So the I here is it says that my father which gave me them. So this is God himself keeping you in his hand. So, and then we go to John 6, 37 through 40. John 6, 37 through 40. All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me, and him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven, not of mine own will, but the will of him that has sent me. And it says, and in... And in this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which hath given me, I shall not lose any, to see, that I should lose nothing, but should raise up again at the last day. And this is the will that he, of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What keeps that together? Romans 8, 38 and 39. So Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the reason for all of the scriptures that I said before can be illustrated in one word. What is that word? Love. He loves us so much that he's willing to do. And the other word that we're going to have is sealed. So we're going to have two more verses of this. Uh, Ephesians, actually we'll just hit one verse. Uh, Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. 
In Ephesians 4.30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. So how long are you sealed for? What do you believe? Forever. You're sealed forever, but you're sealed unto the day of redemption until you die and that you're redeemed. So the last verse that we will do is 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. The last group of verses. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 through 15. First Corinthians chapter 3, I'm way off. First Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, there we go. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of which sort it is. And as this is verse 14, is, um, actually verse 15. If any man's work abideth which he hath built, thereupon shall receive a reward. And this is verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. So the question that I have is, can you go astray from God? Yes. Now what does the Bible say that he does when you go, I didn't put these verses in there, but it just hit me. What does he do when you go to astray? Chastise. Brings you back. So, but it says in this verse, the last in verse 15, but shall be saved, but he himself shall be saved. Um, it would amaze people of all the work that we have here on earth that we think that it is for God and it gets burned up. I think, and I'm not God, I'm, you know, this is just my assumption, but I think that that's part of the tears that's going to be wiped. Because we think that we have all this work that we've done for God and when we actually look and it becomes ash, I think it's like all that time, all of that time, all that energy, and I think that I was trying to do stuff for God and it was just of no avail. So there is no doubt that there will be some standing there looking at the ashes and wondering what had become of their life. But they shall be saved. Why would you lose anything if your actions on this earth can cause you to lose your salvation, what would be the point in burning up and doing anything? He himself shall be saved. So I personally, my personal belief is that a person has eternal security. Not because of any of the scriptures, anybody that they can plug in, but because the love of God that there's nothing on this earth or nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he says that I give unto them eternal life. And the verses that they have, I hope that I did it some form of justice and I didn't confuse anybody. But I think the verses that they have is only means to scare you. Uh, most of the time that they give these scriptures and they want you to lose your salvation is because... They can come along and say, if you don't come to church, if you don't tithe, if you don't do all of these things, then you're going to hell. They can use that as a form of a scare tactic. Well, I lied. 2 Timothy 1.7. I saw this down there. <laughs> 2 Timothy 1.7. Sorry. 2 Timothy 1.7. I thought it was that. 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I don't have to fear if I do something bad if I'm going to lose my salvation. I have to fear if I do something bad that my communication to him will be lost. Uh, if I do something and I sin and I don't really don't feel as close to God, if I sin and I get chastised, if I doubt God um, and you know uh, different things happen that he has to bring me back into the knowledge and stuff because sometimes as humans, we step in and out of stupid sometimes. And we step in and out of things that we should have been over years ago. And God still works with us and still tries to bring us 
into trusting Him. But I don't think that, he sh that we should be fearful of that. And of power and of, a, and of love. So power is the Holy Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit to seal us. The power of the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. He gives us that. And of a sound mind. I think that we should have sound mind and we hear when somebody says stuff falsely. I think we should have a sound mind, like I said before. If you're saved and you understand Scripture and you study it, just because somebody is more learned than you and they have more of a degree doesn't mean that you're any stupider than them. If you know Scripture and they say something false to you, it doesn't matter what they have after their name. If they're wrong, they're wrong. So, I hope that you understand or have more of an understanding of hopefully where you stand when it comes to salvation. And I pray that when you hear some of these verses that you can come back and say um, that if, if I didn't confuse you that you can come back and use these scriptures. Um, but if people that are still watching um, on, online, um, you may be in a church that believes that you can lose your salvation. And I just pray that I know I went over them quickly. Um, I'll hit on them. So you can have them. 1 John 5, 13. John 3, 15 through 16. John 5, 24. Uh, John 10, 28 through 30. John 6, 37 through 40. Uh, Ephesians 4, 30. And then for love, Romans 8, 38 and 39. Um, if they say that you can lose your salvation, bring those verses to them and ask them to explain why are, these church, why are these verses in Scripture? Just ask them. You don't have to be bold and, and pick a fight with them. Just ask them why those verses are there. It is our duty to see through false teaching. It is our duty to make sure that the Word of God is held in its proper place. And even if it's a family member, you need to be able to address them in the right way. But you need to do it lovingly and with respect. Because a lot of people, like me, if you would have told me that baptism, you know, didn't save me back in the day, it would have been fighting words. So some things that you would, you're going to say, it might offend them, but you need to be bold. But do it in a loving manner. Let's pray.